Welcome back. It is our number two of the Lombardi line here on the DraftKings Network. Femi Abebefe, Michael Lombardi out in the great state of New Jersey. We had a fun first hour. If you missed it, make sure you check it out in podcast form. Just search the Lombardi line wherever you get your podcast. Hour number two will be great as well. Jonathan Von Tobel, VEASAN, senior NBA analyst, also dabbles in the college basketball as well, co-host of VEASAN Primetime. He'll join us in 30 minutes to get his thoughts on the Elite Eight games today. Maybe we'll squeeze in some association action as well as we're two weeks away from the end of the NBA regular season, then, hey, playoffs. That's when it gets real in the association. I can't wait for the NBA playoffs to come up. We'll give me get some of JVT's thoughts on that here in 30 minutes. But we begin hour number two with the NCAA tournament. Last night we saw UConn continue in their demolition of the NCAA tournament. That's now on a two-year, 10-game run. They beat Illinois 77-52, sparked by a 30 to nothing run. I repeat, 30 to nothing in the Elite Eight on a run that UConn went on here. Just historic stuff that they're doing here in their pursuit of a back-to-back national title. They cover all the numbers, eight and a half, whatever number you laid with UConn, they covered it. The game goes under the total of 154 and a half. But we'll start this hour with what's on Michael's mind. And Michael, uh, in your opinion, what makes UConn so great in this pursuit of a second consecutive national title? Well, I I think they play a game that they're rising their play to a standard, not just hoping to win the game. The opponent is insignificant to UConn. It really is. They have a standard of excellence that Hurley has set. And I love what Hurley said after the game. This is what's been on my mind. Because we live in this world where everybody's got to go to Dairy Queen. Everybody's got to coach nice. Don't Don't yell at the players. Everybody's great. Well, the job of a leader is to push people where they don't think they should go or could go. That's a leader, right? Because we all, as human beings, often want to take the path of least resistance. We have a tendency to be lazy. We have a tendency to not push ourselves. We don't know how far we could go. And a great leader teaches us where we can go. And Hurley said after the game, I really don't care what people necessarily think of my intensity or my passion. It obviously shows up the right way with my team. We don't cheat. We don't lie. I think we're all about the right things. It's just at times that I'm an a-hole, which is true, which is what sometimes great leaders have to be because you have to confront people when they're not doing what you need them to do. And your messaging translates. And the greatest thing a leader can show you is the team represents who he is. And UConn is clearly an extension of Dan Hurley. They listen to him and they hear him. They don't tune him out. You don't see their huddles where guys are looking somewhere else. You don't see their huddles where guys aren't playing with intensity. You see the players within the culture coaching their own culture. And to me, that's excellence. That's something that we should marvel at. I don't know why we would want to destroy this. Like, I don't know why we would want to tear down somebody who's bringing out the best in these players. Because even if they don't make it to pro basketball – This experience at UConn, learning how to push your limits, is going to allow you to become a better person in your community, a better husband, a better father, a better everything. There is residual effects to his teaching. You know, look at all the people that played for Lombardi in the 60s about how they say he influenced them every day and the perception, well, he was too hard on them. Well, I think if you talk to any of those players, there were moments he was hard. There were moments he was soft. It's all about leadership, and we tend to highlight the negativity, which is completely wrong, and I think Hurley should be commended for his willingness to go against the grain because, Sammy, we've heard this so many times. You can't coach kids like that today. Well, UConn is a, UConn is a now team, and they seem to enjoy being coached that way. Yeah, and they're winning. They're having more success than anybody, and they're doing it in a dominant fashion, which – it's sort of the blueprint. And, and we've seen winners in all sports, in all areas of life, not even just athletics and business or what have you. And a lot of them have sort of this common denominator of I'm willing to go and push the envelope to get to where we need to go. And it's uncomfortable at times. It might not be popular at times. But as a leader, your goal isn't to be popular. Your goal is to be respected and ultimately push people, like you said, beyond where they think that they can go. And I always think back to the last dance and like Michael Jordan, like the, and I think it was episode six or seven when he says, hey, like, I never asked people to do something that I never did. Like, yeah, am I sometimes an a-hole? Yeah, I'm an a-hole. But 
this is ultimately when you look back, we're going to win. And everybody romanticized that watching The Last Dance. But then when we live it in the moment, we're like, wait, why is this guy being an a-hole to his team? Why is he yelling at them? Why is he being crazy? You can't coach. It's just like this is kind of what's required. And that's what they've been doing at UConn. And I wonder, as we kind of talk about this tournament, do any other teams that you've seen in this tournament have similar attributes? Any other coaches have similar attributes? Because if not, it feels like this is just the ultimate UConn coronation that we're going to see eventually next weekend. Oh, I think Calvin Sampson has it. I think he pushes his guys. I think his guys love him. I think they embrace him. I I think, you know, he just unfortunately lost his best player at the most uh, inopportune time. Mm -hmm. But I do think they get pushed. I I think you could see it. I think the coaches coach hard. You know, you you know, I think ultimately, if you're going to try to bring out the best in your players, you got to share your love for the player and then you got to coach the player. And, you know, if you want to be liked, you know, look, look at the stories that have come out recently with the dynasty with New England about, you know, everything was the Crafts reasons why they won. And now we're seeing players who were coached by someone who didn't even get any credit for winning six Super Bowls all of a sudden come out and say, wait a minute, this is wrong, right? This is wrong, you know, and they took my words out of context. Matthew Slater, Julian Edelman coming to his defense. I think that shows you that there's a difference between being liked and being loved. Right. It's the same thing with Kim Malarkey down at LSU, the Washington Post column, which is basically trying to say she coaches too hard. And some of her players came out and said, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's not a true story to me. That's where you're trying to create a narrative that doesn't exist. The dynasty was trying to create a narrative that wasn't true. The Washington Post article is trying to create a narrative that may not be true. Right. And Dan Hurley's getting attacked all the time for his willingness to coach hard. That's the, then they want, and as soon as he loses, they're going to try to jump all over him. But his players are going to defend him. That's what's called leadership. You know, no matter what you want to do, that's what it's called. And you're only going to get the most out of people when you ask them to challenge themselves. Because we as human natures, humans were flawed. We don't want to be challenged. We don't want to do one more set. We don't want to work harder. We don't want to run the hill. You know, because we got it. But when you got it, you don't win. You know, and then 20 years from now, we're all going to regret it. Yeah. And it's similar to what Michael Jordan said. He said, hey, you might not like it, might not like it because that's because you never won anything. <laughs> this is kind of what's required to ultimately win at well, the highest Well, that's who's judging everybody. Yeah. That's, that's who's judging everybody. All, all the other ones are judging it. They haven't won anything. I mean, all these people that are writing columns and are criticizing leadership and coaching – a, they've never coached, and B, they've never won anything. Like, to win a Super Bowl, to win a national championship, it, it, you're going into rarefied air. You're going into some place that requires extreme mental toughness. And give Alabama credit yesterday. You Look, I, I don't necessarily always think Alabama is the best coach team, but they found mental fortitude yesterday in the fourth quarter. They found a way to execute at the stretch. And it's a tribute to Nate Oates' ability for, him to, for them to do that. You know, I didn't think they had it. I thought they were more of a front-running team. But when they got down by 13, they, they showed resolve. They showed mental toughness. That's what you want with your team. That's what you want to try to extend to because you're not coaching for today. You're coaching for a lifetime. You're teaching lifetime things that will help the people that you're leading come become better people in the community. And I think we, we tend to want to play this off as you're being too harsh. Well, maybe, but have you won anything? Are you seeing that kind of leave the NFL? Because this past coaching cycle I thought was really eye-opening to where you have a six-time Super Bowl champion in Bill Belichick, have only one interview reportedly with the Atlanta Falcons. Mike Vrabel goes without a job. He's now a consultant in the Cleveland Browns. Like some of these coaches, like the, the, the whole, I guess, theme of the coaching cycle and general manager cycle was collaborative. We want everyone to work together. Yeah. And, and it feels like the quote-unquote dictator is what at least is being painted on the outside is sort of being pushed to the side. The people who push guys a little bit too hard are being pushed to the side because like you mentioned, you quote unquote can't coach that way in 2024. Is that what some of these NFL franchises are missing? And maybe they could learn from a Dan Hurley and what he's built at UConn with his program. You know, I don't think it's about the dictator. It's about the culture builder. I think they're trying to avoid it. We saw, you know, the Chargers have spent a lot of time trying to avoid the culture builder, right? They've got all these talented players, but they can't win anything. So they finally hired a culture builder. 
And I think there's been a resent, resistance towards culture builders, not towards dictators, towards culture builders, because it takes a lot. It, you have to give up yourself to be willing to conform to the culture. And that's partly the owner. That's the general manager. That's everybody. Like you just the culture doesn't doesn't exist just for the team. It exists for everybody. And if you're not willing to, why are the Jets? Why will they always struggle? Because they have no culture. They've never built a culture. They don't even understand culture. They think it's about adding this piece or that piece or we'll get this player in when there's not a foundation to win with culture. And I think that's what's happening in the league. You know, the league, all the most in the analytic community don't even acknowledge that momentum exists. Don't even acknowledge that momentum exists. So if you don't think momentum exists, how do you even believe in culture? How do you even yeah. believe in culture? How do you create a sense of belonging, which is what teams are all about? The ability to bring people together for a greater cause than yourself. You have to create a sense of belonging. If you don't have that, you can't win. And championships don't win on talent. They win on talent working together. And I think back to my time in Seattle covering the Seahawks, and like I still remember all, a lot of fans were saying Russell Wilson is being held back by Pete Carroll. And I was like, hey, guys, like Pete Carroll is – awesome at what he does and he's really good at building cultures and just because we can't see it because we can't quantify it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist or it doesn't matter and i think that's sort of the disconnect that you sometimes get between the analytical community and some of the uh, people that are actually in the buildings there because hey sometimes like just because you can't put something on a chart doesn't mean that it doesn't matter as we've seen oftentimes in the past with the nfl and with all sports there culture is what matters most we'll talk more nfl on the other side here we're just getting started here on hour number two this is the lombardi line this is the lombardi line with former nfl executive michael lombardi now here is your host femi abbefe on vsan the sports betting network Welcome back. This is the Lombardi Line here on the DraftKings Network. Femi Abebefe hanging out at the Circa Resort and Casino in downtown Las Vegas. Michael Lombardi in the great state of New Jersey. 15 minutes from now, we will be joined by our buddy Jonathan Von Tobel, host of VEASAN Primetime, which you can check out Monday through Friday, 6 to 9 Eastern. Also our senior NBA analyst, and he dabbles as well into the college hoops. We'll talk NCAA tournament with JVT and maybe squeeze in a couple of association questions. Is Michael's guy coming back? We'll ask JVT about that uh, with the play-in uh, seeming to be where the Philadelphia 76ers will ultimately end up. But let's talk some NFL Pro Day here. I know you're shaking your head. Let's talk some NFL Pro Day here with some of the guys that we've seen throughout this past week. Last couple of weeks, we're pretty much all the way through these guys. Bo Nix has had his Pro Day. So has Caleb Williams, Drake May, J.J. McCarthy, Michael Penix. All the Pro Days, Jaden Daniels, have been wrapped up here. Williams seems to be the only certainty that we know as of right now. He's up to minus 4,000 to go to the Chicago Bears with the first overall pick. The commanders, Jaden Daniels, we, we, we heard an interesting soundbite from Brian Kelly, head coach of the LSU Tigers, pretty much saying, oh, yeah, Jaden Daniels, he's going to be drafted by the commanders. I, I, that's kind of sort of paraphrasing, but he made it seem like it was a, a foregone conclusion that Washington would take Jaden Daniels. The market doesn't necessarily agree with that. He's still only minus 160, plus 160 to go to the Patriots. 8 to 1 to go to the Vikings, 9 to 1 to the Raiders, 11 to 1 to the Bears. That'd be a stunner. 16 to 1 to the New York Giants. Are we headed towards Jaden Daniels for the Commanders here? Is minus 160? Is that a good enough price to lay right now as we sit here on March 31st? Well, I, I think that's kind of the trend that it's going. And I think the Drake may work out. You know, Drake May has kind of got a lot of people on different sides of the of the evaluation. If you watch the 22 tape where he was the ACC player of the year, you're more impressed. If you watch the 23, there's too many inconsistencies. But Jaden Daniels' ability to make plays with his feet, he will be inaccurate at times, there's no question. But, you know, his body frame is skinny. I don't care what he weighs, he is mm -hmm. skinny. He, you're always going to be a little concerned about him taking those hits, but... He does make a lot of plays. He's good with his feet. He's good with his arm. I got it hard to believe he's not, if just watching tape, he's a better pro than what McCarthy or Drake May has shown in their college career. One of the things I think that makes this draft so appealing is a lot of guys have started a lot of games, right? Yep. You know, this isn't a one, this isn't a Mitchell Trubisky. I'm just playing one year and coming out, right? There's a lot of games here. So, even Michael Penix, Bo Nix, McCarthy. McCarthy hasn't played as many as these other guys, but Bo Nix and Jaden Daniels have played uh, a host of games, and that gives you a lot of opportunity to evaluate. 
sometimes too strictly. But I do think May, talking to people, there's a lot of love for May still. You know, there's there's two sides of the coin, but there's love for May. There's love for McCarthy, and there's love for Knicks. And that's why I think we're seeing this number at four and a half being really highly juiced to the over at five because I do think – there could be five. Where will Penix go is the one I'm not sure of, but I do think Penix will go in the first. I have a hard time thinking a guy that big, that fast, who throws the ball on the third level as well as he does. He's a better collegiate player to me than Will Levis was. And yeah. Will Levis went at the top of the second. And I think there's going to be more. Now, Penix, a lot of this is going to come down to the medical. So you got to be careful here because if the medical is concerning, it could slip him down the board. But I just think Daniels is too clean for Washington to pass him up. Now, McCarthy, you know, there's a lot to like. There's a lot to be concerned about as well. Same with May. So right now at DraftKings, total quarterback selected in the first round is set at four and a half. The juice is on the over at minus 250. So the favorite outcome would be at least five quarterbacks go in the first round. Maybe we see that number move the closer we get to the draft. If you want to go under four and a half, it's two to one. So you get a lot of plus money there. But just from a more overall standpoint, now that we've gone through the combine, we've gone through the pro days, we still have 30 day visits, uh, the the 30 visits to go ahead and, and go through in the month of April. But it feels like a lot of the hay, not all the hay is in the barn, but most of the hay is in the barn from an evaluation standpoint. Correct me if I'm wrong here. Like, where are teams at with these guys? Do you think, like, let's say the Washington Commanders, would they theoretically know who they're going to draft at number two, or are they still open for business, for trades? Are they still debating Daniels versus May versus McCarthy versus Knicks? Like, like where are teams at, specifically the Washington Commanders, who have the second overall pick? Well, I don't think this is shared information within their own buildings, right? I think everybody is concerned about leaks. So I think what happens is, you know, you all go to a meeting, and after you get back from Jaden Daniels' workout, let's say you're Washington or Adam Peters, everybody comes to the meeting, they read their report, they give their opinion, they leave. And then between him, Quinn, and maybe Martin Mayhew or someone else in the personnel department and the owner, Josh Harris, Magic Johnson, that maybe. meeting is going to be where – yeah, maybe magic. I don't know. It's going to be decided where they go, and they're not going to tell anybody. They're going to continue to play along with they don't know because, you know, the reality of it is is here when too many people know, it will get out, and it can be helpful. So everything gets tightened down. Right now we have a wider circle of information gathering, and as the circle gets smaller, that's when the decisions will eventually get made. And, you know, Sean Payton will probably only tell two or three people within his building who he's going to pick or where he's going to go up. But nobody's going to know everything within the building. And it's all going to be speculative. That's why we'll get some false reports coming out. Oh, this mm. guy likes this team, likes this guy, or this team likes that. It is because you're there, the information chain works its way up. And once it gets to a certain level, then that's when the restrictions come in. The firewalls are built and no one really knows. So people, I mean, there were times where we would go to the we would go to the draft in Oakland, and you know Davis was obsessed with not telling anybody what he wanted to do, and he was always trying to throw you off guard because he was concerned that there was going to get leaks within the building. Now you could tell by the way he would ask questions or the size and speed of a player where he wanted to go, but there was never ever oh we really want this guy let's go get that guy that was that was too much of a of a clandestine operation. So I know a lot of people have made the connection with Adam Peters since he came from the 49ers. We all remember when the 49ers were sort of in a similar situation, picking third overall after they'd moved up in the draft. A lot of people were debating, is it going to be Mac Jones? Is it going to be Trey Lance? Is it going to be Field? Like, 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 where is this going for the third overall pick? Because we knew Lawrence was going one to Jacksonville. Wilson was going two to the New York Jets. Is it going to be sort of that quote unquote like shell game that the Niners kind of like we didn't know until like what the morning of the draft that they were going to pick Trey Lance at third overall. And then even then there was still uncertainty. Is that what it's going to be at pick two or do you think that it'll eventually get out at some point between now and the, and the NFL draft, which is three and a half weeks away? Well, I think Peter's just talked to a lot of people, so I think it eventually will get out. But if you follow what they've done in the offseason, this has been a highly for a team that promoted a general manager and went out of its way to talk about how he was going to run the team. Their signings in free agency have been very coach specific. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very coach specific. Like Dan Quinn's intimately involved in most of these signings, most of them. Yeah. 
Yep. You know, a lot of the ex Cowboys, ex Seattle players. The, the, he's intimately involved. So he and Cliff Kingsbury are going to be intimately involved. I don't think Adam Peters is going to try to force somebody down their throats having come off the Trey Lance fiasco, which sits at his feet, right? Mm-hmm. You know, when you do that, he understands if you don't have buy-in by everybody, it'll never work. And I think ultimately, whether Lance was good enough or wasn't, there wasn't 100% buy-in out there. There was concerns from the start, and those concerns seeped into as it went along. So I think Peters would be smart to make sure that whatever quarterback he likes, he's got to get all buy-in. And I think that's where it's going to go. But we probably will not know. I think, I think based on what, what we heard from Brian Kelly was Brian Kelly was very – was all Brian Kelly was doing was let us, letting us know – how much, how many questions he were asked, and the directness of those questions, which then allowed him to assume where they're going, that he's their guy. See, Kelly was being asked a ton of questions, and through his own processing of those questions, he concluded what he concluded. They didn't say, hey, Brian, we're going to draft your guy. Brian's just basically having been doing this for a long time, understanding the questions and understanding where they're trying to go, and that's what led him to his conclusion. Is Daniels minus 160 to the Commanders or second overall? Is that a good price to go ahead and bet? I, I think it is a good price. I, I do. Yeah, from what I'm told, you know, it is. I, 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 again, but I'm not sure. You know, the, the thing that May has going for him, Femi, is there's this unknown about May. There's this, you know, where is the true upside to May? I think when you watch Daniels, you can quantify where he is and maybe what you think he's going to be as a pro. But I think May's a little bit like Anthony Richardson, completely different players. Yeah. But there's an upside that you can't really determine off the tape. And that upside is an illusion, or it could be reality. And sometimes that upside is so powerful, you're just willing to take it because you're going to get a guy who could be elite. That's, what got jo- That's why Josh Allen was, what, the fifth pick overall? He wasn't the first pick in the draft. There, was, there wasn't enough really consistent tape in him to say, wow. But there was the potential above and beyond that people were excited about. Upside can be tantalizing. And if you start dreaming and said, hey, if we can get this guy to fix this. Well, that's this, what you that. are with the Jets. You're seeing, the, you're seeing the Ifers upside. That's why you're running to the window before the honeymoon. <laughs> no, we're not doing that. Maybe after the honeymoon. We'll see what happens. <laughs> All right, JVT, <laughs> our senior NBA analyst, joins us next here on the Lombardi Line. <laughs> This is the Lombardi Line with former NFL executive Michael Lombardi. Now here is your host, Femi Abebefe, on v the sports betting network. For a limited time, we're offering two weeks of our exclusive betting splits for free. Just sign up at vcin.com slash splits. The vcin betting splits page is updated with DraftKings odds every five minutes. You can see changes in all the action. You get the number of tickets, where the money doesn't match the public opinion, all that valuable information. Once again, take advantage of this limited time offer. Visit vcin.com slash splits now to claim your free two-week access to vcin's betting splits. Welcome back. This is the Lombardi line here on the DraftKings Network. Femi Abebefe, Michael Lombardi, and joining us now here on the Progressive Guest Line, Jonathan Von Tobel, host of v Primetime. Check that out Monday through Friday, 6 to 9 Eastern Time. Also our senior NBA analyst. We'll get to some association a little bit later, but JVT, good morning. Thanks for joining us. We'll start with the NCAA tournament. Last night, I mean, we saw UConn just demolish Illinois 30 to nothing run. They ultimately win the game by 25 after shooting 17% from three point range. They're now taking on Alabama in the final four. Does Alabama have the makeup to stay competitive with UConn? We'll have all week to break that game down, but I want to get your early thoughts. Do the Crimson Tide have the makeup to stay within that number of 11 and a half over at DraftKings? I mean, I, I would say, Femi, the short answer is yes, only because if you have the ability to shoot like Alabama does, and score and play with that kind of pace, you're, you're going to have the, the ability to do that. And, you know, anything is possible. And it's funny how we're talking like in that tone, right? Considering <laughs> that this is basketball, but UConn has looked that good. But I would say like generally, yes, the 
look at else, it's the defense. And when you look at so many different things, you don't first turnovers, 291st in the country enforcing turnovers. When you're an underdog, you got to be able to steal possessions. You're not going to do that here. You're probably not going to be able to get second chance opportunities against the best rebounding team in the country. And UConn, who was absolutely great, had 37 defensive rebounds yesterday. Um, and keep them off the offensive glass? Probably not. So, like, when you look at just so many different things, by the way, 311th in the country in terms of defensive foul rate, Alabama. So are you going to be able to defend without fouling and putting them on the free throw line? So I would say, Femi, like if you come out and they just start scorching the nets and they're hitting every single shot, which is certainly possible, I think that absolutely they can stay within this number. The problem is that's what you're asking Alabama to do. And I, and I think that's it. Like when you look at UConn, they're so sound in every single facet of their game that generally when there is a weakness, they will pick on that weakness of their opponents and they will go after it every single time. And, and, and considering how high this rating is, I'll say it, I just I find it hard to try to get in front of this train net right now with, with the UConn Huskies. I just don't want to do it. You know, NC State and Duke played twice, and NC State is kind of the most confusing team. They lost seven of the last nine games, and then all of a sudden they got hot. They got a big man in the middle. They beat Duke soundly in the ACC tournament after losing, what, by 15 to them? I mean, it's seven. Is the line too much, JVT, or are you going to back uh, Duke in this one? You know, if we're going by just pure like market ratings, Michael, the, the argument here is that this is a cheap number for for Duke. And this is why, you know, uh, on Friday night when we saw those results come in and you see those numbers pop up and uh, and you see everything like you see the Duke starts to rise here a little bit. And I think that's the case. Let, let's go back to Michael. You mentioned the ACC tournament in which NC State won that game. On a neutral, you're talking about Duke as an 11-point favorite. When they played at NC State, Duke was a six-and-a-half-point favorite. And yet here we are now on a neutral in a rematch, and you're just talking about seven. So, like, from a pure number standpoint, there is value here on Duke, which is why you saw that six go from seven almost immediately. And I would say that's the case. Look, NC State's playing extremely well. They're obviously red hot. You guys mentioned DJ Burns with his uh, vending machines. I don't know if you saw that story, but he's got a massive, like, I guess, a glut of vending machines around that area of the country. The kid's absolutely tremendous. But I think when you look at the ability of what Duke can be defensively in this matchup and the fact that the market has swung this far in just a matter of a week or two, guys. Like, this was a neutral site matchup of 11 points, and now we're laying seven. And I think sometimes, Michael, I readily admit, it's probably a short-sighted nature of mine when you're talking about just going by market ratings and numbers and saying, well, there's there's some value here, and you kind of ignore recent form. But I think that that would be the case here. I think the market has gotten this right and driving this up from six to seven. Just from a number standpoint right now, I, I think there is value in coming in and betting the Duke Blue Devils here. Duke laying that seven. Right now the total sitting at 143. That will be the final game today here in Dallas in the Elite Eight. We're hanging out with Jonathan Von Tobel here on the Progressive Guest Line. JVT host of Prime Primetime. Once again, check it out Monday through Friday, 6 to 9 Eastern time. Also our senior NBA analyst. Well, let's talk about, in my opinion, the main event. I know it's the matinee, but this is the main event because this is, I mean, someone's got to go to the final four. Rick Barnes or Matt Painter here. The Boilermakers, yep. three-point favorites. Total 147 and a half here. A, a little bit of interest on the volunteer tiers this morning all the three and a halfs are pretty much gone here do you agree with that move or is Purdue being a little bit undervalued look I mean I think they're being undervalued I, I had them in that matchup against Gonzaga it was one of the first bets I had made that Sunday prior after watching them dismantle Utah State I think Purdue has kind of figured this thing out and their guards have gotten better but you watch the way that they play like you throw two or three you, I mean you throw three bodies at Zach Eady. He's so big. He's he's so tall, obviously. With his ability, he's gotten, I think, better as a passer out of the post as well, Femi. So when he attracts some of those double teams, he knows where to find his guys. They are such a good shooting team, literally the best shooting team in the country at just over 40% as a squad. So when you start to bring doubles, they can swing that thing around, find an open shooter, and make teams really pay. I think the market has kind of slept on Purdue a little bit here, at least in the NCAA tournament. You know, guys, and rightfully so, right, because this run extends for UConn going back to the last NCAA tournament. But there's another team that's quietly covering by double digits in every single one of their NCAA tournament games, too, and that's Purdue. And they've done it, too, against some competition that a lot of people thought were going to be pretty live. A lot of people uh, were getting in on Gonzaga before that game started against Purdue. That thing was a sleeper in the second half. Purdue looked absolutely incredible. I've really come around on them, guys. Like, ever since watching that matchup against Utah State, betting them against Duke, or excuse me, Duke, uh, Gonzaga, and seeing them go forward, I, I think that there's a lot you can do here. You're a better shooting team than Tennessee. I think that you can actually come in here and win this by margin. So I laid three with Purdue. Uh, you know, rode them in the last game, and I think I'm going to do it here. I've been wildly impressed with what they've been able to do so far.
JVT, what the, fir- the first time they played back in November before Thanksgiving, uh, Purdue mm-hmm. was a four-point winner in, in a tournament game on a neutral court. How much do you, how much difference is there between that game and this game? I think it's pretty big, Michael, and that obviously, like, teams improve, they change, and I think Purdue's just gotten better since that time, right? I mean, this is a team that, as we expected coming into this year, was going to be better because their backcourt was not as um, as uh, veteran related, right? They weren't really prepared for an NCAA tournament, but now they've got some more games under their belt, and that was a good litmus test here uh, when you talk about what that's been and this run-up to this point right now. So I think that's it. It's how much have these teams improved over that span, and you could totally make the argument Tennessee has as well, especially on the defensive end. Tennessee's fantastic, but I think when you look at the way those two teams matched up and what happened in the previous matchups, Michael, one of the things that I think will transpire a little bit differently, Purdue in that match was just 415 from three-point range, under 30%. They're a much better shooting team, as we know. I don't think that's going to transpire. Meanwhile, Tennessee struggled to shoot in that matchup. Tennessee actually is not the best. Now, they shoot a high volume of threes, so that's offset by their percentages, but I still think that when you talk about the ability of the math game and, okay, who's going to win from beyond the arc? It's going to be Purdue. Who's got the best player on the floor? I think you can make the argument. Obviously, it's Purdue, uh, even though, of course, we know how good Tennessee has been uh, with their guys, but I, I think overall, I've just been so impressed with this recent stretch from Purdue, and I'll go back to really quickly, Michael, the Big Ten tournament, where a lot of people were like, oh, man, lost to Wisconsin. I think the Boilermakers had bigger fish to fry. I thought that that was very much a performance of like, all right, if we win this thing, that's great. If we don't, we got something to take care of here, and they look every bit of that part. Yeah, I mean, the last time these two teams play, I'll just point out, Tennessee called for 30 yeah. fouls in that game yep. in Maui. That was the Maui Invitational game. Purdue won that one 71 to 67. All right, let's get to a little bit of NBA. Of course, JVT wrote up on VEASAN.com his best bets for the NBA for today. We're not going to be able to get to all of them, though, but check that out over at .com. Uh, I know a game that you do. like. You like Cleveland, it sounds like, today. Getting the five here, or why do you like the Cavs? Yeah, I played a little bit here. Jamal Murray's questionable, guys, but he's it looks like he's not going to play. Michael Malone had some comments on Friday that it's going to be unlikely today. They want to get him back before the postseason starts. Um, so it took a little bit of five here. And Donovan Mitchell is back. So now this Cleveland team, for the first time in a month, is fully healthy. Max Drews came back the other day. Donovan Mitchell is finally back in this last game. And when you look at the way they played against Philadelphia, Mitchell only scored 12 points, guys. But him and Garland looked great. They both combined for 20 assists. The ball was moving around. This team's starting to get comfortable. And I think Denver, too, as you've looked at the recent results, two and five against the spread, they have said many times, Femi, we just want to make sure we're healthy by the time we get to the postseason. Cleveland, too, trying to fend off New York, who gets Oklahoma City today for that better seed in the uh, second round. Of course, we want to be able to avoid Boston there in the second round of the East. So I think all those things considered, I I took five here with the Cleveland Cavaliers on the road against Denver. And then the Dallas Mavericks, currently they're in the sixth seed. They're a half game behind New Orleans for the fifth seed in there. And they're really only two games behind the Clippers for the fourth seed. And they're playing Houston today, laying two and a half. You like them. Yeah, Michael, so I'm going to look. I've kind of been watching Houston, right? And we all have. And they were great. 13-1 straight up straight uh, in the month of March. If you look at it, though, guys, uh, nine of their opponents ranks 20th or lower in net rating. They've really picked off a a weak slate of of opponents here over this stretch. And even the good teams that they have faced, they've had a fortunate draw. Shea Gillis Alexander didn't play in the matchup against them uh, like last week. So I think that we're finally going to run into a little bit of a wall. And we did with their power rating on Friday night. Didn't cover against the Utah Jazz. It's getting a little high here. But the way that Dallas has been playing, Doncic is questionable, but expect them here. It's a divisional game. They need divisional wins. they got to improve their record because they can still win the division over New Orleans. That's still a possibility here for the Dallas Mavericks. So I expect a full-throated effort for the Dallas Mavericks who went to Sacramento and got two massive wins in a baseball series. They're playing really good basketball right now. So a little bit of a risk. Make sure Luke is going to play. Uh, but I took the risk here late two and a half with Dallas. Right. Well, like the Golden State Warriors, JVT not worried about the Houston Rockets. He is Jonathan Von Tobel. Check him out on VEASAN primetime Monday through Friday, 6 to 9 Eastern time. Also, VEASAN.com for all of his NBA write-ups. JVT, we appreciate the time, man. Be well and good luck with the bets. Happy Easter, guys. Thanks. Thanks, happy, JVT. Happy Easter, indeed. We'll wrap up the show coming up next here on the Lombardi Line. This is the Lombardi Line with former NFL executive Michael Lombardi. Now here is your host, Femi Abebefe, on VSEN, the sports betting network. 
There's never been a better time to have skin in the game with DraftKings Sportsbook because right now we have a VEASAN exclusive offer for new DraftKings customers. Earn a $500 bonus bet for every 1000 you wager. You can earn up to $2,500 worth of bonus bets in your first three days on DraftKings. Don't wait. Download the app now. Use code TLL when you sign up and earn a $500 bonus bet for every 1000 you wager. Now, this is specifically catered to VEASAN listeners and viewers. Go ahead and get it done. DraftKings Sportsbook app, promo code TLL. Welcome back. This is the final segment of the Lombardi line here on the DraftKings Network. Once again, happy Easter to everybody out there. Uh, both Michael and I, we got our pastels on, ready to celebrate Easter Sunday here on March 31st here. But thank you to Jonathan Von Tobel, who joined us on the Progressive Guest Line in the last segment. If you miss it, make sure you check it out in podcast form here. JVT, like Julian Edlow, who we had on an hour number one from The Sweat, once again, Saturday, Sunday, right before us here on the Lombardi line, 8 to 10 Eastern time. Both guys like Purdue. Our producer, Elliot Bowman, Big Purdue fan. Grew up in that neck of the woods. They're just outside Indianapolis. Michael, should Ellie be worried? I mean, a lot of people like Purdue here. The number's at three. How do you feel about this game? I mean, are both of our guests like them? I kind of yeah. lean that way as well. I, I think Purdue I think Purdue has been kind of like the brider in the Tour de France who kind of hides behind the lead rider so he doesn't get all the wind in his face, right? I think they've allowed Connecticut to kind of take the steam and take all the heat, which Connecticut loves and embraces perfectly. They, they have no problem with it at all. But I, I think what JVT said is rather convincing, and, and, so did, and so did Julian. I mean, the fact that they have been so dominant in a conference that is considered one of the best conferences in college basketball – that they were able to, you know, they lose to Ohio State in kind of a game, a little bit like the Creighton loss for Connecticut. It maybe just wasn't in the cards with Holtzman getting fired, the new coach coming in. It kind of played out. But other than that, I mean, this is a team that has played well all year, met every single challenge. I don't know why they're not going to meet it today. And their ability, what I saw when they played Gonzaga, Femi, was I saw a championship team that got better as the game went on. You know, we have these expectations when we watch these games that in the first 10 minutes are going to be over. Mm -hmm. And great teams never end the game in the first 10 minutes. Great, they get land body punches, they figure out what the game is going to be, and then they figure out how they're going to win the game, which we saw, obviously, what Connecticut did yesterday as they just took over the game. And I think ultimately that's what Purdue is. The, they wear you down. And I think Tennessee's just going to have to shoot lights out to beat them. I just think any time they need to stop a run, they can get the ball into Eddie and he can score on them, and that, that kills runs. And, and when you watch these runs, you know, it's hard to get it stopped. And, and I think ultimately that's what we see. I mean, Illinois, you know, they, they, they kind of got – I think the Illinois player by four minutes into the second half said, you know what, this is just – wait, this is hard. Yeah. Everything was hard. And I think that the wear and tear on your mind is what, what this tournament's about. It's like Bud's training. It's like we can do it the first day, but that 80th day of Bud's training is really hard. The biggest compliment that I can give Purdue is that I thought Gonzaga actually played pretty well Friday night, and Purdue still was able to take care of business of them in the second half. Like, like Gonzaga did about as as well as everything, they, they, the ball screens they had it rolling there. They kind of frustrated Edie a little bit in the first half, but – None of it mattered. Purdue was just, they had that extra gear. They had that extra level. And I think what JVT's point about the guard play for Purdue this year versus last year, because that was the big question mark last year is, hey, what are these freshman guards going to do? And they ultimately lost in the first round. But those freshmen are now sophomores. And Braden Smith, I mean, he's taken his game to another level to where he was all Big Ten. He's sort of played at that All-American level this year. He's been the facilitator for that offense. And Edie, he's better than what he was last. He won National Player of the Year last year, and he's better this season he's going to win national player of the year again right. i think that this purdue team is really complete and it's going to take the likes of a yukon to ultimately beat them like if they play yukon yukon will be favored in the game as yukon's favored against everyone but i think in this particular it, matchup it, i i trust purdue which i guess famous last words in march but i trust them in this spot it's what we hope could happen right because look yeah. purdue can play defense without fouling i mean gonzaga only took seven free throws the other night right yep. And you could say whatever you want about Gonzaga. They shot over 50% yeah. from the two-point line. Now, they, they, <laughs> they were 6-19 well. from the three-point line, but they didn't get to the line. They couldn't get to the line. And to me, teams that play well 
that are able to not foul on defense, don't turn the ball over. They only had nine turnovers. That's the recipe. That's the that's the avoid losing to win the, the analogy that we always talk about in football, right? What do you have to do to win a football game? You can't turn the ball over. You can't commit fouls. I mean, when you're getting into that bonus with eight minutes to go or ten minutes, that, that's the goal of every coach is to get the other team into the bonus so you can shoot two easy shots and get two points. And Purdue can play defense without fouling, and, and they're selfless, right? You know, Brandon Smith had 15 assists the other night. I mean, that, that means, you know, you're able to play within the framework and the role of your team, and I think that's something to be spoken for. I really do. And Gonzaga, Gonzaga wasn't the Gonzaga that we remember of past, but they're mm-hmm. still a good team, right? Yeah. And, and they wore Gonzaga down. I mean, they wore them down. They wore them down in the second half. They scored 40 points to their 32. So, to me, I think that's kind of the way this game's got to go. And can Tennessee match it? I, I think you got to ask yourself, can Tennessee continue to shoot the lights out like they did? You know, and they went on that incredible run against, against Creighton. And Creighton's sitting there probably thinking we had a chance. But, you know, when you, when you are – when they were 11 for 24 from the three-point line, that kind of eliminates your chances, right? Yeah, no, I think a fun matchup in this game is going to be Braden Smith, the Purdue guard, versus Zakai Ziegler, the Tennessee guard, because Ziegler was SEC Defensive Player of the Year. He is a dog on that end of the floor there. Those two guys battling back and forth, I think it's going to be really entertaining uh, for the fans of just the X's and O's of basketball. Yeah. And, and can, well, can both he make teams more? don't turn the ball over either. Yeah. Yeah, both, because of the good guard play, these teams don't turn the ball over. I mean, Tennessee only turned the ball over four times when they played against Creighton. And, you know, and Purdue only turned the ball over nine times when they played against Gonzaga. So they do a good job of protecting the basketball. And they do a good job of, you know, they had 16 assists the last game. I mean, Smith had, what, 15 alone. Yeah, Smith was, uh, he was cooking in that game. They're finding all those guys. And it wasn't just Edie, it was the shooters. It was Gillis, it was Floyer and Jones. All these guys had it going against Gonzaga. And Gonzaga's a really well-coached team. Mark Few always has his guys in the second weekend of the tournament. And they wore him down in that second half, winning that one, going away and covering the number. The late game... 5.05 5.05 Eastern, 2.05 West Coast time, Duke, NC State. I'm always fascinated by these games to where you have the power rating and that on one end, and then you have recent form on the other end. And JVT brought it up in his segment last uh, last segment here to where, yeah. yeah, like the power rating says that this might be a cheap number on Duke because this was 11, 17 days ago, but recent form has NC State winning eight elimination games in 18 days. Like what do you weigh more, hev- more heavily? Is it the power rating or is it the recent form? how you're playing right now. I mean, and look, let's face it. I don't know if Duke's here if Shed doesn't get hurt. I mean, that, I think that's pretty clear. Played 13 minutes the other night. Does Duke win that game if he's on the court? I don't know. You know, and the way that this North – look, one thing that losing does, it destroys your confidence. Winning increases your confidence. And these games are so close and they're so tight, right, you know, that you just find – you just believe you're going to find a way to win. I think Clemson felt that way all yesterday. I think Clemson truly believed that they were going to win that game. I think there was a conf- – even when they were down five with two minutes, you could feel Clemson had confidence. They just couldn't make free throws, right? And Alabama made shots when they – they made the threes at critical times. But this North Carolina State team, to me, is very confident. And, and Duke is probably thinking, well, we beat them once – we kind of let it get away. We can refocus. That This is a different team. You know, every game provides a different team a different way. And the way Burns is playing, the way he's controlling the pace of the game, the way they're able to do so many things, uh, you know, where they are, you know, they can th- – he throws the ball, like you mentioned, out of the post. He can mm-hmm. lead with assist. He had seven assists the other night. I mean, I, th- I think it'll be a fun game. I, can Duke win? Sure. I think it'll be a close game. I don't think – I would lean towards taking the seven and mm. North Carolina State because I think those past power rankings aren't indicative of where the teams are currently today. Yeah, it's kind of like what Julian Edlow said in hour number one. It's like, where has this NC State been all all season? <laughs> like, you know, they've been playing really well. They beat Marquette. And that was – it wasn't a fluke they are winning against Marquette. That was a wire-to-wire job. They beat Marquette in that spot here. And like you mentioned, Duke can still win but not cover seven. Like, they can win by five or whatever, and you would still win your bet if you take the points with uh, with NC State. I just think it's so fascinating. Like, when you get those two competing thoughts, the market says one thing of, hey, the power rating should be more, but recent form – Probably should weigh that a little bit more heavily. It's kind of what we that had with then, the Chiefs. 
remember this, then is then, now is now. That's and it. you got to understand that how you're playing now really matters. And NC State's pr playing pretty damn well as they're just <laughs> one game away from potentially going to the Final Four. We're going to get an ACC team in the Final Four. We'll find out which one later on this afternoon. Michael, enjoy the rest of your Easter. Have a happy Easter. I'll talk to you happy tomorrow Easter, for the GM Shuffle, Happy man. Easter, Elliot. Good luck. All right, for our Good producer, luck, Elliot, Elliot Bowman, for our for Michael Lombardi and our Italian crew behind the glass, I'm Femi Abebefe saying all the best of luck with the bets. The handle with Mike Somich and Matt Brown is coming up next.